Welcome to the Stanford Innovation Center. My name is Peter Propp. We are here with Drew Lambert of Dartmouth and Steve Hafner of, uh, of Dartmouth and the CEO of Kayak. And Steve, we're, we're just delighted you're here and, and we really appreciate you being here for us. You're gonna need to get closer to the microphone when oh, it's yeah, time yeah. to answer. That's fine. Um, so so the, first, the first question, um, here's, here's a way that's gonna work tonight. Um, we, we ask the audience to give us questions ahead of time because we're, we're tr we try to uh, capture these in, in, in quality video that we can then use and other people can, can view. Um, and if we have audience questions, too many questions from the audience, the audio quality is horrible. So that's why we have your questions ahead of time. But I think after about an hour or so when we run out of these, uh, we'll turn off the video cameras and you guys can ask a, a few more questions um, as long as Steve can handle it. Um, so, so the first question is really what I like to call the, the origin story. Everyone likes to know how, uh, how Peter Parker became a Spider-Man. So you know, you know, take us through your early career. I know, I know you worked at Marketing Corporation of America um, in, in Westport. And I know I feel strongly, I think you do too, that one of the strengths of, of, of our region is, is the depth of, of really strong marketing talent um, that, that works in, in, in many different, uh, both corporate settings uh, and in some of these tremendous uh, sales promotion firms that are, that are all up and down Fairfield County. So take us through sort of your experience in MCA and how that led you over to, uh, to Orbitz. Sure. So, hey, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to see all you guys here. I had no idea for, that the Stanford Innovation Center even existed until these guys contacted me. So it's a, it's a great resource. Am I close enough to the mic? Sure. Um, you know, when, it, when I started Orbitz and Kayak, I had no idea there were facilities like this to help you. Um, I'm just curious, of the people in the room, how many of you guys are budding entrepreneurs or own your own business or run your own business? Wow. Okay, so you guys know exactly uh, where I'm coming from and you know, where you guys want to go. Um, so the origin story for me is, is pretty simple. Um, you know, I went, to, I went to Dartmouth like so many of you guys did, and uh, on, upon graduation was confronted with a choice of you know, two options, basically, invest in banking or consulting. Uh, so uh, I, I chose to go with consulting because my brother was an investment banker and I saw his quality of life was very, very low. You know, he, he worked at, you know, 100 hours a week, and, you know, when he socialized, he really couldn't afford to buy anything um, because, because of rent payments. Uh, but I noticed I could go work at MCA, which for those of you guys who aren't familiar with them, well, they don't exist anymore. So you, um, it was a consulting company that was in Westport, right on the river, beautiful offices. I could get my own office. I could wear shorts to work. It was all ex-Dartmouth people, and uh, they paid the same wage as an investment bank. So for me, I was like, hey, I'll take this job. It's fun, I can wear what I want to. I can pay 300 bucks a month for rent and, and go for it. Uh, and what was great about that company was there was no middle management. It was all senior marketing talent, you know, ex P&G folks, et cetera, who were then bringing in um, you know, recent graduates to do the actual work, right? So I started off my career as a PowerPoint uh, monkey, basically, for these guys. Uh, and it was, it was a great start. So that, that was the origin of my, of my career. It wasn't, more thought than that, um, but you know that, that's that's where I started. Right, and then and then from from there, sort of, you were there for how long, and then? Oh, you want long answers? Um, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's okay. I mean, somehow you get, went from MCA eventually to. to yeah, so I you know I worked there for four years, and I decided, hey, it'd, it'd probably be good to go get an actual education in some of the things that I'm telling clients, because um, you know at Dartmouth's a great school, but liberal arts. I majored in economics and history. I didn't know the first thing about marketing. I didn't know the first thing about uh, business development or accounting or any, any things that you need to know or legal to run a business. And I knew I wanted to run a business. Uh, so I decided to go back to business school. Okay. Um, got into Tuck, but did not go. I didn't want another two years at Dartmouth. But uh, so I ended up at Northwestern. And uh, after that, you want me to keep going? Yep. After that, I went to uh, the Boston Consulting Group because I was like, hey, it's consulting. I know how to do this. Uh, it was a great office environment there, and it was a uh, good conversation, and conversation was important to me at the time because, right. you know, I, I didn't come from money. Um, after being there for three years, I was seeing what was going on with the Internet. You know, I was living with a couple other guys, and one of them went and uh, helped co-found uh, Yahoo. The other guy went and helped co-found Amazon. Uh, another guy went to... <laughs> Another guy went to uh, Sequoia Capital, which basically invested in all those other companies. And, and I was like, okay, well, they're selling books online, and Yahoo's about media online, and Sequoia's about funding them. Why don't I do airline tickets online? So that was, the, uh, that was back in the day, for those of you guys who remember it, where you get an email every Wednesday 
of fare sales for that weekend. And you got one for each airline. And there was no single place where you could actually aggregate all that information. And it was also a time when companies like Travelocity were out there where you could, you could do a search for an airfare, but you only got nine results. Nine. So I, I said, well, gosh, let's, let's do this differently. Let's have a, a new online travel company that's owned by the airlines, that has all the information, that presents you 250 results, every flight combination, et cetera, and, and let's launch that. So that's, that's what I did. So that, that eventually turned into Orbitz. Right. And, and, and you were there for Orbitz for, for, for quite a while. Yeah, for four years. So that was back in 99. So uh, we started the company with three people. Uh, within three years, we were 1,600 people. Uh, we went public for $1.4 billion. And um, a couple of months after going public, we sold it to a company called Sendent that doesn't exist anymore. Right. And uh, right after that sale, uh, or two weeks later, I quit and started Kayak. Okay. So, but, so Internet One, as you mentioned earlier, was, was a bit crazy. There was a lot of stuff going on. There were a lot of fly-by-night. There were a lot of really great ideas that never went anywhere, valuations, IPOs that were ridiculous. Y you know, you guys sort of stayed, stuck to your knitting and just focused on your, your one business, and you, you had these good partners that were probably keeping you pretty honest. Yeah, I mean, there's two different approaches to, uh, to having success in business. Um, one is the slow and steady approach of, like, sticking to your knitting and being focused, and the other is, you know, the, the the fast and, 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 and um, dirty approaches. So I, I you know, it, it, the latter is not sustainable and it all depends on timing. So the latter is Groupon. The former is Kayak. So there, there are a lot of companies that, you know, seize a new idea. It's all about marketing themselves to investors, um, growth at all expense, et cetera. That, that wasn't either Orbitz and that wasn't Kayak. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's the sustainable, slow and steady approach is, is, is the right way to go. Um, build a sustainable business. Don't, don't rely on the flip. Right. And so, so you had this experience with, or it's one of the things that, you know, it's probably obvious to this audience, one of the things that we see again and again as we're, we're trying to talk to, to startup people and trying to figure out which ones are going to be the most successful, the ones we run into here at the Innovation Center, is the people that have had a previous experience, either good or bad, they're the ones that, that most people feel are, are going to have a better chance of succeeding um, than, than someone who's, who's just trying to do something for the first time. doesn't mean you can't get lucky or, or, or be successful, but a, a previous success or a previous failure tends to be an indicator that you're going to have better success down the road. So, y you know, as, 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 as you looked at Kayak, or, or as, you, as you left Orbit, so Orbit's in the rearview mirror, and you were out of it for, for how long? And then what was the sort of secret sauce behind Kayak in your, in your mind? Yeah, how, how many people here use Kayak? Cool. If you don't, shame on you. Um, yeah, so the, the insight behind Kayak was a simple one. You know, actually, a lot of great businesses get built on just very simple ideas. So when I was at Orbitz, you know, we had built this great company, but I observed two things. First off, 90% um, of the people who were coming to Orbitz were doing a search for an airline ticket or hotel room, but they weren't booking. They would do the search, and they would go supplier direct. And the second thing I noticed was that on Orbitz, we didn't have every flight, we didn't have every hotel, we didn't have every rental car company, because some of those companies just didn't want to do business with us. So what we were really doing was we were a search engine with incomplete results. Mm. Uh, and then on the cost side of the equation, we had this huge customer service operation. So we were 1,600 people, as I mentioned, but only 200 of those people were actually doing marketing and business development and sales and the website design. Now, the rest were in the call center. So I said, this is, this is kind of... Uh, kind of crazy. Why don't we just make a search engine, not have a customer service operation at all, um, search all the supplier sites, all the um, suppliers, the airline hotel sites, all the uh, online travel agencies like Orbitz, Expedia, and Travelocity, give the consumer a complete view of what's available, and then give them choice on where to book. So once you find the flight you want, if you want to book it from AA.com, bang, we'll send you there. If you want to book it from Expedia, bang, we'll send you there. So it was, um, it was a pretty simple insight, but it had never been done before. So, yeah, right after we sold Orbitz, two weeks of downtime, and then I uh, incorporated Kayak. Wow. Um, one of the things I, I've used recently on, on, on Kayak was the, the airfare predictor. So, yeah. so I, I've been looking for, uh, to book a trip, and it was at, you know, I don't know, close to $500. And, and then there was a little line underneath that said, by the way, we're, we're darn sure this is going to go down in about six weeks. Yeah. So hold off. The I mean, that's an innovation that the airlines are probably not delighted with. 
Yeah, they don't like it when it says wait. <laughs> but, um, you know, most of the time it'll say buy. So, look, we, you know, back to your comment on big data, we have every day on Kayak we'll do 100 million queries for airfare or hotel information. And from that you'll get a lot of information about what consumers are looking for and how prices are changing on routes, et cetera. And we use that to build this algorithm that predicts what's going to happen with the prices. And we show that to consumers on the left-hand side of the, our search results page. It's, it's useful for some people, uh, but in general, if you find a price in a flight that you want to buy and it's in your price range, buy it. Airfares go up normally over time. Um, all right, I'm handing over to, uh, to Drew for a few questions. Cool. All right. Steve, thanks again for coming. Um, we have a few audience submitted questions, and I apologize, we obviously couldn't get to everyone's, but I think we selected enough questions to kind of run the gamut of, of what everyone was, uh, was looking for. Um, my, my first question is actually my own. Um, when, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm single. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, when, uh, when we first started talking about you doing this uh, event for us, you had just gotten back from vacation. So I was wondering where you booked your trip. <laughs> I actually booked it from Expedia, but I found it on Kayak. Um, yeah, I just got back from Miami, too, which is why I like, look like leather. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, well, that's a good answer. Um, all right, so a lot of people are asking about the milestones that you found you know, in starting Kayak. Um, you know, that specifically, the most significant milestones that you reached in the first 18 months of the company Talk about how those events were meaningful and how aware or unaware you were that these milestones would have such a large impact on the future of your company. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, you guys, it sounds like a lot of you are building businesses or are running your own businesses. Uh, you know, there's the administrative milestone, incorporating your company, having a law firm, getting payroll, getting taxes in place, all that kind of stuff, which is a, a lot of work. You know, the government doesn't make it easy. Um, so there was, there was that. So, you know, we incorporated the company January 14th, 2004, so a long time ago now. But all that stuff was a pain in the ass, honestly. The second was getting a team. Because uh, we knew it wasn't about the product concept. The product concept could have been wrong, but if we had a great team, we could pivot. Uh, so, you know, and, and for me, it's the kayak is an internet business, so we need to have a great engineering team. Because the, the first thing we had to do is build a great product experience. So um, I knew we were onto something when we were able to hire uh, a great team of 12 engineers out of Intuit. You know, guys who knew how to make high volume software. And we got those guys on board by the end of January. So, you know, we had a payroll, we had finance function, we had a team now. Now we could build a product. The next big mail milestone was actually getting that product out to market. And uh, speed was critical for us because we knew we were outgunned by the big OTAs. Uh, we knew Google at some point in time was gonna come into the market so we had to get a prototype up and out and start having consumers interact with it so we could observe consumer behavior and make the product better. And that was actually Cinco de Mayo. So tomorrow, um, we're, every year we have a huge party and celebrate it. Um, oh, really? So we're going to do it tomorrow. Excellent. So there, there will not be a lot of work done at Kayak tomorrow. Well, uh, there's, <laughs> there's actually a follow-up question to that is when did you realize you were onto something big and that sounds like the moment. Yeah, well, no. Actually, we launched the product and I could, I could never... Uh, make a financial model that had us tr making a profit. So, but, but despite that, we were able to raise some, some venture capital money. Um, but at, at, we hit this inflection point where traffic, repeat traffic back to the website just clicked. And it happened with Facebook, it happened with tw Twitter, it happens to a rare uh, group of companies. And it's all about getting the product right. So we finally got the product right, and um, you know, 18 months into the company, we turned a profit, um, which was shocking because it didn't jive with any of uh, uh, the financial models I made. Yeah, you, you should all be trying to turn a profit, if you're not. <laughs> so then I guess if, if not that, you know, really get out there and launch type moment, when was that moment, that inflection point for you? Um, I, I knew we had it when um, we passed 10 million visitors a day. Okay. Yeah, that's, 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 that's when I knew it. And, and at, at that time, we were 33 employees. And, uh, and um, you know, you, you see this with a lot of tech firms where you build a great product and it just, just kind of takes off and, and, and we were fortunate enough to hit that point. And then once we had that, we knew, hey, uh, we're making money, let's invest in marketing. Because until then we had never done any marketing. So we launched TV marketing in October 2009 and then that was like flowing gasoline under the fire. Yeah. So we did have a question about what, what your biggest uh, obstacles were. I mean, we kind of touched on a couple, but. 
Any any other major obstacles you? Uh... The, the the biggest obstacle is actually getting agreements uh, with content providers, with the airlines and hotels and and the uh, online travel agencies to play with kayak. Yeah. Uh, for lack of a better term, not only to play but also to pay for the referrals. So that was the, that was the first one, and then the second one is just um, and it's true of any internet business is uh, the biggest barrier is consumer habit, awareness and habit. You know, most people, and I'm sure a lot of people here still go to Expedia and Travelocity and Orbitz directly. Why? Go to Kayak. You, you know, we, we have all their information. But the, the answer is habit. You're used to going to Expedia. You like the way it looks. You have an account there, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we do have a couple of questions from a, a friend you went to business school with, so maybe a little more, a little more tactical. But... I did um, not touch her. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, wanted to have you talk a little bit about uh, your co-founder, Paul English, um, how you guys arrived at the opportunity and, you know, get the joint experience from, uh, from both your past together on, uh, on Kayak. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of research out there that says having co-founders works really well because no one person can do it all. I have... Huge flaws. Um, you know, I can't write a single line of code, for example, which is not a good um, thing for an industry or internet executive. So Paul English is our co-founder and our chief technology officer. He is awesome at all the things that I suck at. So he, he's great at recruiting, great at coding, great at managing teams, um, an outspoken advocate of the product. You know, I, I'm, I'm more commercially bent. Um, you know, I, I look at the day-to-day -day performance metrics, et cetera. So I think... As you guys go about your own businesses, have, recognizing what your weaknesses are and then finding someone who can, you know, who's complementary to what you do poorly is so important. You know, and, and you can look at Yahoo and Google and lots of other companies that are far better than Kayak who had that dynamic of the co-founders. Uh, co -founders, and it, it just works. You know, for example, I, I actually don't enjoy doing events like this, public speaking. It's not my forte. Paul loves it. You know, you put that guy in front of a camera... Um, and he's just, he's money. So it, it's, a, it, it's a small example, but you know, as you guys seek to build your businesses, find complementary talent to, to your own deficiencies. Excellent. Um, so this was a question about uh, responding to the competitive threat that Google potentially placed yeah. or, or poised. Um, did you make strategic decisions beyond pushing hard on the lobbying side to prevent you know, Google from stepping in and just buying yeah, you guys. It's, it's, it's funny. Um, we're in the online advertising space. That's really what the company is all about, is collecting ad dollars from, um, from the Expedia's and the American Airlines of the world. So we always knew we were going to compete with Google. And the issue with Google is um, just about everybody begins their travel research at Google. You know, you'll type in cheap flight to Paris or cheap Chicago hotel. Um, so we knew that, that um, they were going to come to the market at some point. Thankfully, it took them nine years to come into the market, and by that point in time, uh, we'd essentially won, uh, and that's and that's still true today. So you know what what I would have counseled you is every company can do th two to three things well. Um, Google's no different from that. You know, think of all the things they don't do well, right? So they do search well, they do Android well, and uh, they do Gmail well, but they didn't work with places, reviews. Google Plus is sucks. Uh, Wave uh, sucks. So you know. Thankfully, travel meta search is something that Google sucks at. So, <laughs> be less sucky. Be less um, sucky. You know, be, being <laughs> better than your competitors is is uh, important. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be better. Yeah. All right. Um, so, I guess everyone kind of wants to hear a little bit about the acquisition and uh, you know how things are going and um, where you guys are. I know the deal hasn't quite closed yet, yeah. but uh, just talk, talk a little bit about that and what it felt like and uh, you know, where you are. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Anytime you guys have success with your business um, and it's self-funding and you're, you're going well, it, uh, it's odd to sell, right? You know, I've, I've sold two companies now and, and it, it's, it's a painful process to go through. Priceline was actually a fairly easy process. You know, we, we know those guys really well. They're great. Um, the synergies, the economic sense of combining this, the businesses make a lot of sense too. And then finally the price was right. So, you know, the, the past year at Kayak has been a crazy one. You know, we went public in July um, at a, I don't know, a billion plus valuation. 
And then uh, Labor Day weekend, their CEO calls me up and says, hey, Steve, come out to our Cape Cod house and, and let's, let's sell your business to mine. Um, and they, they agreed to pay $1.8 billion, which was you know, a, a nice return for people who bought our IPO, a 50% return. So you know, there's, there was no way for us to say no. But, but the important thing for, for me and for our employees was to maintain our operational and cultural integrity. And that's, that's something that was very important to us in the negotiation with the company, and, and Priceline is committed to that. So, you know, for, for day-to-day people who, use, who work at Kayak, it's, you know, no, no change of business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're, we have our own building, we have our own culture, et cetera. For me as a CEO, it's great not to be a public company CEO, because that, that's not fun. It's, it's fun to go public, it ain't fun to, to be public. I can tell you that. And then for our employees, it's, um, it's nice once the deal close, closes for them to have um, security, financial security. So at, at Kayak, we were 220 people, and we made 100, a little over 100 millionaires uh, upon the, when the deal closes, which wow. you know, for me feels great. That's wow. amazing. Um, and you're here in Connecticut, so that's, that's just wonderful. Yeah, it's, 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 it's funny. Um, when you were talking about why Connecticut, you, know, you didn't ask me the question, but it was about marketing, access to marketing talent. You know, so all of our engineering talent is actually out of Boston. Uh, we didn't want to be in, in California because it was too competitive a market for engineering talent. Um, but in Boston, we can attract MIT guys. And then in Connecticut, we can get marketing professionals. And uh, the biggest item on our P&L is marketing spend. It's 50% of our, of our uh, P&L. So this year, we'll spend $180 million on marketing. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, a little over a million and a half per employee. Well, that was actually a question about the, uh, the technology community, where you're sourcing. I mean, have you found Fairfield County, um, our area, to have um, a good base in technology, or are you sourcing most of it from, from outside? Uh, we source it all from outside. So I don't know what these – has anyone here had good experience with technology here in Connecticut? We're growing it. We're growing it. Yeah, I know. You guys yep, are doing all the right things. But we're doing our best. Yeah. I mean, is there anyone here who's a, who writes code, who's an engineer? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if we were doing this event in Silicon Valley, half the room would raise their hands. So access to engineering talent is, is really um, difficult. But, you know, not all you guys are doing internet. I only think internet, so it's, it's a biased approach. But, um, yeah, but marketing, finance talent, managerial, biz dev talent, and has got it. Excellent. Um, and um, yeah, so so uh, you you touched on something that that, that I found a lot um, in the in, in the software business where I come from. A lot of a lot of companies get acquired, and the 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 value of the acquired company evaporates a- almost immediately. It's it's frightening. And it seems like the, the way you're working, uh, clearly the price, price line folk recognize that you only have value as a, as a trusted third party that's looking at all the sites. Is, is, is that pretty much the relationship you have where they, they really want you not in their building? They want you to stay independent? Yeah, I mean, so, fo- so far that's, that's been the approach, and they've done that with other acquisitions. You know, we're not the first company they've bought. Um, they're one of the best uh, acquirers of companies, I think, in, on the planet. Um, but the deal hasn't closed, so who knows for sure, right? We, we've bought three companies, and I said everything to the companies that we bought, the right things, and we did something very, very different. So we'll see what happens after the deal closes. Uh, but I'm optimistic. Um, but it, no, in, in, in general, you know, for us, uh, Priceline is just a different investor. Instead of having a board with eight VCs, I have a CEO I report to, and that's it. So it's, it's nice to have one boss. Yeah, but... Um, you know, for you guys, as you consider the, f- the future of the businesses you have, you know, it's, it's tough to give up independence um, and, and to sell out, especially if you've got un- unfinished business. And we have a lot, a lot of unfinished business at Kayak. Right. Um, how would you describe um, your relationship with, with, with all these different suppliers? That you're, you're, you're driving a lot of traffic to their sites. You're, you're managing a good percent. I don't know what percent of, of how many of the of the clicks to their site when yep. people ask for to see all the fares, all the providers, you're providing significant traffic for them. What, you know, how do you maintain a good relationship with those guys? What's that all about? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, one of the, the Expedia CEO, Dara, um, is a great guy, described Kayak as a moped, right? 
fun to ride, but you don't want to see your friends on it. Um, and and a, a lot of them have that relationship with us, which is they'd prefer that we weren't around, that people were going directly to their websites. But the fact of the matter is, Kayak is a superior consumer experience. You know, we have all the fares, we have all the hotels. You're going to get a better answer as a consumer if you go to Kayak than if you go to any of those sites individually. Right. Um, so, you know, once we started getting marketplace traction, all those guys wanted their fair share of, uh, of our, our traffic, and it's, it's significant. So um, we're now the third largest travel site here in the U.S. in terms of monthly visitors. Um, and to, you know, to our business partners, we're a significant source of traffic, and we're a very eff efficient means of acquiring customers. We charge half the price of Google um, and deliver them far more impressions uh, or uh, referrals than Google does. So it's about having a good value proposition, a good uh, relationship with advertisers, and not, not being a pig about how you, how you do your economics. Interesting. Um, one question I, I've never heard answers, where, where did the name Kayak come from? <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny, um, our, our VCs hated the name, but uh, my co-founder Paul and I were adamant that Kayak should be the name of the company. We, uh, we hired a company in, um, in New York called Wolf Owens, who's a, a, a naming agency, and this is back when we had only a couple million dollars in the, in the bank account, and they, they charged us half a million dollars to come up with a name, which at the time, our VCs were like, just make a name up, right? And we're like, no, we gotta, we, the name is going to be the most important part of the company because that's where the spend's going to be. The spend for the company to get it to, is going to be in marketing. So we came up, we screened 50,000 names. Um, we, get, we gave them some very simple criteria which are meaningful. Uh, in the internet, there's a lot of research that says if your name is longer than six characters, your direct nav traffic, so people who type you in, goes way down. So we said, hey, it's got to be six uh, letters or, or shorter. So think Google, think Yahoo, think eBay, think Amazon, um, you know, direct, direct names. We said, it's got to be uh, non-travel. It can't be cheapflights.com. It can't be, um, you know, Travelocy, anything with travel related in it. We, we wanted a non-generic name. The, the reason for that was we wanted a blank canvas that we could paint our own brand imagery against. We said it's got to be um, language um, independent. So that means like you can use kayak in Germany as a brand name. You can use kayak in Sweden as a brand name, et cetera. Uh, you know, you want to avoid the, like the Chevy Nova example of selling the Nova in, in, in Mexico. You know, it doesn't go. Um, and then it has to be available and affordable. So it's funny. We, we paid the, the agency half a million dollars for the name to come up with the name. It was our third choice. And we paid 50 grand to IBM to actually get the URL, to actually get the, the, the website. Um, and it, it, it turned out to be a, a great success for us. It's a, right. it's a great name. This is a great name. Um, and, and Orbitz had a similarly sh uh, short name. So did you, we had the same advice back then? Or? Yeah, same, same exact um, approach with naming Orbitz. Okay. Yeah, but, um, actually our CMO, our chief marketing officer at Kayak was the chief marketing officer at, at Orbitz. So we went through the same naming experience and we knew how important it was uh, right. to, to, to get the name right. Interesting. Um, all right, well, I, th I, think, I think we, we maybe have enough time to answer, ask some questions to the audience. Yeah, yeah, I can I can repeat questions too for the camera, so it's it's easy. Microphone? Yeah, I'll 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 be uh, Monty Hall or whatever it is. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Barron's had the big article about the travel industry and the internet companies and um, so I wonder if you could comment on whether you thought it was a fair description of what's going on with Priceline and whether you come out on the other side of the uh, argument. Yeah, I thought the Barron's article, for those of you who read it, was uh, very well written and very balanced. Um, you know, it was basically talking about consolidation in the online travel space and, you know, with Expedia buying a company that's very similar to, to, to Kayak in Europe and, and Priceline buying us, whether our business models would change, et cetera. And the, and the answer is our business model isn't going to change. You know, what, Kayak is all about providing consumers with comprehensive search results and choice on where to book. And that's not going to change. You know, what, what the Priceline acquisition does for us is enables us to take this business model and expand globally at a much more rapid pace. So right now we're, as I mentioned before, 220 employees, but we're actually in 18 countries. Uh, but Priceline operates in 85 countries. So we're going we're gonna to piggyback on everything they know how to do um, and get international launches much more quickly. So if you think it's a, it's a pain launching a business, incorporating a business, launching a business in the U.S., think about doing that in 85 countries. It's hard. It's hard. 
Hi, Steve. You mentioned um, starting in January, hiring a team, and then figuring out what you were going to do. Obviously, that takes money. So I'd love some advice about how do you raise money in advance of having a business and volume and profit? Yeah, well, you know, we had a six-page PowerPoint deck, and uh, I wouldn't go more than that um, in any of, your, any of your pitch decks because what you really want to do with the VC is engage them. So, look, the, the pitch to get money was pretty straightforward. We said... Use Orbitz, use Expedia, they're incomplete results. Um, we can build something that's better. We can get paid for it. Look at what Google's charging people for referrals. We can charge half that price. And then um, look at how big the market opportunity is for online travel. Online travel is bigger than every other e-commerce category combined. It's huge, it's enormous. And then you have all these companies that are acquisitive in the space. So the pitch was actually pretty straightforward. It also helped that we had a seasoned team. You know, I could go in there and say, hey, look guys, We've done this before, we're not amateurs, we can do it again, but we can do it better. Um, and then the last component was, I was fortunate to uh, make a little bit of money on the Orbit sale, so I could self-fund it. And Paul uh, came to us from Intuit, and um, he had sold his company to, uh, to Intuit for a, a fair bit of money, so he could self-fund it. So it's, it was nice to be able to have the luxury of going into a, pardon me, a VC sales pitch and saying, hey, it's a great idea, We've already funded it. We put our own dollars behind it. We already have the team. We've done it before. And if you're lucky, we'll take your money. And that's basically what the pitch was. I have two questions kind of combined. Um, so you mentioned that you, uh, you, test, you did a prototype and tested it for a while. And I imagine that's where you developed some of your initial audience. But I'm wondering how you scaled that to 10 million before any marketing. And how long of a time frame you actually did that testing before you decided to go live and sure. what was the trigger point? Sure. So we actually launched it, uh, as I mentioned, in Cinco de Mayo, but it was a Flash-based app. Does anyone remember Flash? <laughs> what a, a mistake that was. Anyway, so Flash was, well, anyway, if you use Apple products, you have no idea what Flash is. But it was basically a programming language and experience that required you to have Flash downloaded on your computer. Stupid. Half our audience didn't have the latest, greatest version of Flash, so they couldn't even operate our website. So anyway, so we went back to HTML, but I digress. Um, so, you know, so we launched the product, we saw that it was getting traction, how consumers were actually using it, how many searches they were doing per session, what they were clicking on, and that was really great. But um, the initial driver for traffic to the website was PR. So we, um, we hired a great agency, and then we came up with this cheesy tagline that Kayak was brought to you by the co-founders of Travelocity, Orbitz, and Expedia. So, uh, you know, I got the former CEO of, of Travelocity to, to, to join our board as chairman, and I got the former CEO of Expedia. And that talking point of, hey, people who build these great other travel sites are doing something new and different. What is it? We use PR as a driver um, for probably the first 18 months. We also went out and did some affiliate deals. We went and signed a, a deal with AOL, for example, where we took over their travel um, area. That was back when AOL was actually a relevant company. Um, yeah, it's weird to think that Kai is closer to their, them in value. But anyway, um, and then the last part is we did search engine marketing, which is you know, advertising on Google with those text links and that kind of stuff. And, and in, in the early days, I managed those accounts myself, the keyword structure and the campaign structure, and then you know, it's, it's ramped up from there. So I think now we, we've probably bid on 3 million keywords in you know, 16 countries, and we'll spend this year $85 million on Google. It's crazy. But, and then the last element was the offline marketing campaign. And that was something that the VCs on my board had never had any experience with, right? They usually sell their companies before they have to start doing offline TV marketing. And we got to October 2009 and I said to the board, hey, you know what? I think we need to spend $40 million next year on TV advertising. Let's start this quarter. We're profitable. Let's dump 15 million into it. And these guys almost turned around. They almost threw me out of the room. But, um, but we did it. So we hired a great uh, CMO, we made some commercials, we launched them on the air, and then we held our breaths and waited to see what's gonna happen to traffic to the website. You know, what's our incremental cost per search gonna be? And for the first three months, it was a complete disaster. And then January came, and all of a sudden, in January, our traffic went up. We're like, hey, marketing's working. But for the first three months, man, I thought I was gonna lose my job, I did. So that's, that's how it started. 
Um, in the U.S., by 40% year over year. Yeah, but you have to get this minimum threshold of impressions for consumers before they actually start saying, hey, I, I remember that ad. I'm going to go, I remember now when I go look for an airline ticket or a hotel room to use Kayak. Steve, at what level did you get to when you started charging for traffic? I'm sorry, I didn't... At what level did you get to before you started charging for traffic? Targeting for traffic? Charging. Oh, charging for traffic. You know, we, we charge for traffic from day one, uh, but we had to do it on a supplier by supplier basis. So, for example, we knew the, the online travel agencies like Expedia and Orbitz were, were always willing to pay. But some of the airlines aren't. You know, they, they think that the content is theirs. So American Airlines, for example, came to us and said, I'll, I'll show my fares on Kayak, but uh, you're going to pay me for it. And we said, no, we're not going to pay you for that. Uh, we're going to get your fares from Orbitz. Uh, and then we entered in some litigation. You know, it, it was interesting to fight against American Airlines when we were seven months old. You know, and eventually we figured out that that's not a good strategy to fight with your business partners. So you know, I went paws up on the ground, and we and we uh, resolved the litigation. But uh, you know, it, it 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 takes time. You know, for us, it's all about the product first. So we want Kayak to be a comprehensive search engine. So if someone's not going to pay us, we'll put them on the website. And then over time, we'll say, hey, look, there's so much demand here. Um, that we can do better things for you if you pay us. You know, we can add tracking. We can give you data on what your market share is by route. We can tell you, hey, here are consumers who have looked for a, a flight on this route on Kayak, and now they're on Yahoo. Do you want to serve up an American Airlines ad to them on Yahoo? So retargeting, uh, which, is a, which is a big thing in the Internet these days. So it, it took a long time. What's your view on Hitmonk? And has it changed your business plan at all? Oh, Hipmunk. So who's familiar with Hipmunk? Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, look, travel category is such a big um, sector. Like I said, it's, it's half of all e-commerce. There's always room for new companies to come in. But the, the problem with Hipmunk and for a lot of folks is it's like starting a new Google today. It, it's too late. So they're outgunned in terms of engineering talent to ours. They're outgunned in terms of brand awareness. They're outgunned in terms of financial flexibility. So they, they haven't made any impact on our business. You know, I mentioned before that, that uh, Kayak's doing 100 million queries a day. Hipmunk does a million a month. So they're, they're a day late, you know, knife, knife to a gunfight. But they're, you know, nice guys. We look at them and what they're doing with their website. And sometimes we say, hey, what they're working on is kind of cool. Let's launch that on Kayak. Hi. Um, I, I, curious question. You were at Orbitz. Your team was at Orbitz. Two or three weeks later, you're founding Kayak. Astounding. Where was all the lock-in, the non-compete? I mean, somebody yeah. missed something, right? Yeah. Um, no, actually, you know, what, what I had with, with Orbitz um, was a non-compete, but I didn't have a non-solicitation. So that means that I couldn't go into the travel business, but I could take the whole team with me and go do something else. You know, go do healthcare or something like that. Uh, so I went to uh, the CEO of Orbitz, who I reported to, um, and said, hey, hey, Jeff, let me do travel, and I promise I'll sign a non-solicitation instead. I won't take anyone here to do it for one year. And he said, good luck trying to compete against Orbitz. Sure, I'll sign that. So uh, he released me from the non-compete. Uh, I signed a non-solicitation. And then a year later, I went back to Orbitz and stole all their people. Do you, uh, do you ever foresee Kayak moving to other verticals? Uh, so the question was, do I foresee Kayak going to other verticals? The answer is no. Highly unlikely. You know, if, you know, I mentioned earlier that a company can do two or three things really well. Uh, for us, if we can do simple itineraries, flights, hotels, rental cars, really well, and if we can do that worldwide, um, we'll have a very, very nice business. So it's, it's funny, for, um, for April Fools, we launched a kayak meta search data, dating site. So it actually looked through bash.com and a couple other websites on unauthorized basis, basically. But it was a, it was a joke. Um, and it, people loved it. <laughs> so I, I, got, I got a lot of email about it. And, and there are people who say, they're, hey, I'm the kayak of auto sites. I'm the kayak of healthcare. I'm the kayak of credit cards, et cetera. Um, let them be the kayak of that. You know, we'll be the kayak of travel. So uh, you clearly placed a big bet on marketing and obviously won. For people who have been skeptical about the RI on marketing, what kind of advice would you give about like the top two to three qualities to look for in a CMO or vice president of marketing? 
Yeah, you know, it, 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 it depends what your business is. You know, marketing, I think we, we've done better than a lot of other companies, but I know we have tremendous waste in what we do. You know, we just can't really identify it. Uh, you know, I, I would not hire a CMO these days who didn't understand digital marketing. Because um, at least for an internet business or where you know, anyone who's younger than 35, they don't want it. They don't watch TV anymore. They don't listen to the radio um, unless it's Pandora or Spotify. Um, they're online. So you've got to have digital marketing. Social media would be a plus, but I don't think anyone's figured out how to market in Facebook. You know, we certainly haven't. Um, so digital marketing would be the first one. If you're going to do TV, you need someone who's great at creative. Because uh, TV is expensive, so, but you'll, you can hire media planning agencies to help optimize your frequency reach and your CPMs. But the creative is a crapshoot. You know, Kayak has pretty good commercials. Um, commercials are expensive. They cost half a million to a million dollars to produce each, right? Uh, um, you make a couple of mistakes with your creative, your media spend isn't coming back, and the money you sunk into that commercial is not coming back. And we make a lot of mistakes in our creative. You know, so if you guys have seen Kayak TV commercials, some of them are hit or, hit or miss, and I'd say we're 50% hit rate. And to follow up to that, how much do you think about ROI on marketing, and how much do you say, I trust you, and you win more than you're going to lose? I don't trust anyone who works at Kayak. Um, <laughs> no, you gotta, you gotta measure it as ROI. You know, the digital part is a, a lot easier to measure than the offline, so with digital, you know, you can drop a cookie on consumer's behavior, um, so we look at 14 to 30 day look back tracking on what they actually do on the website. Um, for our display campaigns, we look at retargeting, we give them view through credits. If this is like over your heads, sorry. Um, and on the offline, we'll, we'll run it in test markets. So we'll say, okay, this city is kind of similar in this city, so let's run ads in this city. We'll see what the uplift in search volume is, and that'll give us the uh, good benchmark or indicator on ROI on that, on that offline spend. But it's, it's tough because it's, it's hard to do it well just in the U.S. When you start doing it in multiple countries, your ad creative's got to be different, right? Because you can't have talking people. If you do, you have to dub them. Um, the media economics are completely different. So when we launched in Brazil, for example, Brazil TV market is dominated by one com company. So the ad rates are sky high. 90% of the Brazilian population isn't connected to the Internet. So you're advertising to people who aren't going to use your service. And then... <laughs> To make all the matters worse, it's a, it's a mobile market. People download apps, they don't go to websites. So the marketing approach in Brazil is very different than our marketing approach in the US, and those, those uh, complexities are really tough to manage. I wonder if you could spend a couple minutes on the early days at Orbitz. You've spent most of the night on Kayak, unreal success story, but as you yourself said, you know we've cashed out once for a billion dollars, it's the same guys, it's the same investors, perhaps, yeah. whatever. For a lot of us, you know, maybe we get there, maybe we don't. But you know, the first few months at Orbitz, where you had to hire programmers, maybe without money, or it, spend a couple minutes on that and how you and how you did that. Yeah, well, at, at Orbitz, we actually raised the same amount of money that we raised at Kayak. We just raised it in different in a different way, which is we took eighty percent of the equity or the cap table for for Orbitz and gave it to the airlines, and they gave us two hundred million dollars. The difference is at Kayak, uh, we ra also raised two hundred million dollars. We went cash flow positive after spending 30 million. At Orbitz, we went cash flow positive after spending 199 million. Um, so it's <laughs> a different operating ethos. Um, you know, Orbitz was back in 1999, that's when we started it. That was the height of the internet frenzy. Uh, eight months later, it was the, the depth, right? It was a big crash. And, uh, you know, we almost, we almost died. We almost died. We, our marketing campaign for Orbitz was $100 million in three months. You know, at Kayak, we spent 15 over three months, and we were, you know, quaking in our boots. So it was different, but, it, you know, back then, everybody was spending that kind of money to, to get brand awareness in the Internet space. You know, think about Pets.com and Webvan and all those guys. That's what we were competing against, and it was, it was tough. But, um, but we knew we had something cooking there because four months after we launched Orbitz, to the general public, which was in September, sorry, sorry, it was in June 2001, we had already passed Expedia to be the second largest travel site. And that was because we had, you know, better inventory and, and a better display. Uh, and then September 11th happened, uh, and, you know, that, that was a tough day because, you know, we were doing well as a company, and uh, our CEO came to the office and um, just told me I had to, I had to lay off 40% of my staff that day. 
uh, and uh, you know, through through no fault of their own, and we gave them two weeks severance. So that that was that was tough. But you know, we haven't experienced that at Kayak. Thank thank gosh. Uh, did Priceline make the same mistake that Orbitz made? And um, well, well, yeah. So what's next for you? Yeah, you know, um, it's not a mistake when they see it coming. So you know, what what I negotiate with with Priceline is uh, none of our employees have to continue to work with with Priceline, and and the reason that's important is it it keeps them honest, right? So they they have to keep us uh, independent and happy. That's really my job is to keep our employees motivated. Uh, the second part of your question is, what, what am I doing? I'm going to work for Priceline for as long as they'll have me. You know, I, I, I love Kayak. I want Kayak to be the number one travel site worldwide. And we're, you know, we're, we're number two or three here, depending on how you, how you look at it. Um, outside the U.S., we're, we're really irrelevant. So uh, there's a lot of unfinished business uh, for me at Kayak. Uh, this doesn't count as a question. He's got a question. I've got a real quickie. My quickie is, what was the second name? Oh yeah, so it was a so kayak was our third option. The first one actually, yeah, the first one was actually cake, because you know when, when you say cake, everyone smiled. You guys are all smiling. <laughs> You're like cake, that's cool. I like that cake, you know. And it's you know shorter to type in, and and everyone understands that um, that name. So cake was the first was the first one. Uh, we couldn't buy it. Um, the second was actually uh, Tessa, actually Tessa slash Lola. We like both of those names. So maybe kayak was the fourth name. Uh, Tessa was owned by two college girls um, who were both named Tessa and used that website to post photographs of their antics. Uh, we offered them 50 grand for it and they wouldn't sell it to us. <laughs> uh, which was odd because I, I even went so far as to buy the domain Tessa with the numeral two. The numeral two. I said, guys, it's Tessa two. It's 50 grand. But they were like sorority girls from Rollins and you know, made a lot of money and they just wanted their own website. Um, <laughs> And then the, the, the third name was, was Lola, which is short for Longitude Latitude, which we really liked. I thought Lola would have been a great name for a website, too. But um, that was owned by British Airways. They still own it, and they would not sell it to us. Uh, this one uh, probably applies to Kayak, but actually Orbitz is a similar, but you had a very different deal with airlines. You launched essentially a business that was aggregating data from all over, data you did not own. And you went out very confidently saying, no problem, we're going to launch this thing. And we got all this data that any one of those sources in your business was predicated on owning all that data, aggregating and presenting in a, in a, in a superior fashion. Right. How did you do that? How did you convince somebody? Well, I know you convinced somebody to give you money, but how did you do that and get it working in a, in a very short amount of time Yeah. To deliver it, on it? it? Yeah, it was hard. I mean, the, the, the premise of Kayak was one search and you're done. So we, had a, we, we told consumers we had comprehensive search results. Right. We didn't. But we had better search results than going to any other travel site on your own. So as soon as we signed up two sites, we knew we could say we have better inventory than one site alone. So the first company we actually signed up was Orbitz. So I signed up Orbitz, and then I went and signed up a couple of the airlines that Orbitz didn't have directly, like JetBlue, and said, OK, now we can actually go to consumers and say, well, Kayak is just like Orbitz, but with JetBlue. Right? And so you know, that's, that's kind of how it started. And as we got marketplace traction, more and more suppliers and, and agencies wanted to come on board. So was it, what's the timeline like? I mean, at, w at what point did you have a, let's say, a 2x you know, to what Orbitz could offer as a, as a user? About six months. But you know, six months into it, when Orbitz started seeing that we were gaining market share, they terminated their agreement with us. <laughs> yeah, and they pulled out and you know, basically tried to kill us. And um, you know, so we, we scrambled and found another online agency to be our, our anchor partner. And you know, six months later, Orbitz had to come back to us and said, hey, we'll, we'll do this deal again, but on, on these conditions, which was, um, which was a great feeling for me, personally. But they came back. Brought them back. Thank you. Well, Steve, thanks so much for your time. This is wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Oh, thank you. Thanks.